Hi, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking about my all-time favorite horror novels, part two. Let's get started. I did part one of this video a while ago, and I've been meaning to make this part two for a while. I just like haven't gotten around to it. Every time I think like, oh, I should film the second part, there are like three other videos that I have to do. And it's just, it's just annoying. Like, it's just so hard. It's just so hard being me. I've also done my eye makeup a little bit differently today. I don't know how I feel about the red on the inner corner. I think next time I'm gonna do yellow on the inner corner and then work my way out from there. Cause I don't think I like the red and the, like this. Cause I think it brings my eyes closer together. Anyway, it doesn't matter, okay? I'm also showing a bit more like cleavage than I usually do. I'm kind of feeling it. Like she's serving me, she's serving me like mammary glands, you know? Mosquito bite energy. <laughs> She's giving us like freshly cracked eggs. <laughs> giving us itty bitty teddy committee kind of vibes, you know? She's she's like there, but she's also not there. And I'm kind of into it. Like, I don't really have boobs, you know what I mean? So it's like, oh my God, is it a boy or is it a girl kind of vibe? I'm like, okay. <laughs> So my non-existent titties are out. Um, also, big news, Spooky Smart Bitch Readathon is starting in about two weeks, which is crazy because what the fuck? How? I have so many videos that I want to shoot and upload before then, so I'm hoping that I can. I had this idea the other day, we're going to also have a little live show. I'm thinking about inviting a few booktube friends to join me so we can talk about the beginning of Spooky Smart Bitch, we can talk about our TBRs, uh, that would be sometime in the beginning of August. Also, so have to talk about you, talk about how you've grown how you've become such a great, beautiful, mesmerizing person. And not even that, but like an individual. Like you've really stepped into your own and you've really made great waves in everything that you do. Not only that, but like you look so good. Like literally, I wish I had an ounce, an ounce even of your beauty, of your grace, of your delicacy. I don't know what that means, but I think it's a good thing. I think you look amazing. And literally, if I looked even half as good as you, I would I would literally rule the world. Like, I don't wanna say that I like don't look good, cause like, I do. I think if I had even like a little bit of your beauty, I think I could literally like dominate the world. And I think that could totally happen. Um, but I don't have your beauty, so probably actually won't. Anyway, I just had to say that. I had to get it off my chest. You had to know, you know? Now, on to favorite books part two. I wish I had nails for this video. I keep meaning to do them, but I'm a lazy piece of shit because it takes so long to do them, like at least three hours for me to do both hands. And that's for like a no energy like nothing, doing nothing special kind of set. If I wanted something like a little bit extra, it would take even longer than that. By the way, don't forget to hit subscribe, okay? Don't forget to like the video, okay? Don't forget to comment down below, letting me know your favorite horror books and stuff, okay? And don't forget to press the little bell thing. I don't know what it does, but like, just go ahead, just, just, Thing. <laughs> you know, it's not fun. I want to pick up where we left off on the last one. And we were talking about Michael McDowell, who is an angel. He's um, up in heaven right now with like Jesus and I don't know, other good people. Uh, you know, rest in peace, Michael. God bless you. I want to talk about Blackwater by Michael McDowell. Blackwater by Michael McDowell is a family saga horror drama novel. This edition specifically is a bind up of six books. These six books in the Blackwater series. We're following this girl named Eleanor 
and Eleanor one day is found by these dudes in like a boat. One of them is Oscar and Oscar sees Eleanor, sees that she's like stranded and he's like, oh my god, let me take my hand, young missus, let me rescue you. Come on board and we'll rescue you because their whole town is kind of flooded. Eleanor, she's gorgeous, she's stern, she's kind of what every woman should be, I guess. <laughs> according to Oscar and so she's like okay fine I guess you can oh, fine okay <laughs> go ahead yeah I guess I'll come on board okay so she goes back with Oscar her and Oscar fall in love they get married she becomes part of their family Eleanor is kind of a mystery to everyone everyone's like oh my god where is this bitch from we've never even seen her before it's like a small town you would think we would have seen her so like, where are you from, Eleanor? Where are you from? The thing is, Eleanor is hiding something about herself. She is actually a like swamp lake monster. Eleanor is a swamp lake monster. She can turn into a human being, this thing, but she can also turn into a monster and eat people. Now, from all the books that I've read from Michael McDowell, this is least horror-ish. Like there's still aspects of horror, there's still aspects of like, holy fuck, what am I reading? But most of it is like this really compelling story about a family and like the different generations in that family. I've said this before and I'm gonna say it again. Michael McDowell's characters, they leap off the page. You fall in love with them so easily, so quickly, and you become so interested that it's like impossible to not care. Like I can't even imagine somebody DNFing this book because they didn't think it was interesting. These characters' lives are so interesting. We're following these people's lives and every single aspect of their greatest joys, to their deepest sorrows, to the dynamics between family members. It's not my favorite Michael McDowell, but it's certainly up there. Like, it's just as good as The Elementals, it's just as good as Cold Moon for Babylon, it's just as good as The Amulet. By the way, if you haven't seen part one, you should go watch part one. <laughs> I will link it up above and also down below, just for you. Just for you. This is so good, dude. It's so fucking good. I can't even put into words just how much I love this little series. And by little, I mean big, because this is like a big, chunky fucking book. I think especially if you're new to horror or if you want something that's a bit more subdued, this is great. This is so good. It's so mwah. Plus, it literally goes with every outfit. <laughs> oh, my leg is asleep already. How is that possible? Speaking of subdued horror, let's talk about Off Season by Jack Ketchum. Off Season begins with a woman being chased by what seems to be a group of people. The book starts off with this sort of standoff between somebody who is a victim and uh, a group of people who want to murder her. And then we're introduced to another group of people, one who are trying to have a nice little weekend, a nice little getaway. It's like a relaxing time. However, on the first night there, this group of people on vacation are awoken. Middle of the night, this group of people, they throw a rock through the window. They snatch one of them, this woman, they drag her out into the yard. And from then on, this is a gruesome, gory book about a small group of people's fight. Literal fight for survival. I genuinely think that this is the goriest book I've ever read. I'm trying to think about it and I think it is. I think it literally is the goriest book I've ever read because there is so much packed in on every single page. You turn a page and it's just more and more and more blood. Blood, blood, blood everywhere. Hello? Hi, Mr. Ketchum. Hi, it's Jordaline. I don't know. I don't know how I got your number. Don't worry about it. Don't ask questions. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that your book is like really, really gruesome and I really liked it. It was great. It was really, really cool. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I do have immaculate taste. Um, I am literally perfect. I'm so glad that you know that. Thank you so much. 
Stop. Oh my god. You're embarrassing me. <laughs> yeah, just wanted to let you know that. I know that you've passed away and stuff, but just thought you should know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Kisses. Mwah. Bye. Personally, for me, Jack Ketchum's beginnings aren't that great. What really gets me, though, is his action. Typically, the last three-fourths of his books, I will just devour and love. And this was no exception. After the moment, the moment that this bitch got fucking taken out and, like, dragged out of the window was the moment where I was like, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> let's go. I'm so excited. So excited. Everyone else is terrified. Cool. <laughs> it's great. I love it. There's so many different parts of this book are just iconic just completely iconic and surprisingly for a book like this where it feels as though it's going to be quite formulaic is actually full of twists and turns and shit that you do not expect like at all no at all at all it's gruesome it's extremely gory there is a massive amount of like cannibal sort of triggers a massive amount of like gore blood and descriptions of dismemberment stream extreme cruelty towards like other humans it is a blood bath like get in the tub maybe turn on the faucet put the little plug in the in the bottom uh, and just watch as blood gushes in because it's a blood bath you're taking a blood bath <laughs> this is my favorite of his books I much prefer this to The Girl Next Door because this, at least in my head, could be kind of fun and The Girl Next Door is much more depressing and not as much fun. <laughs> I also want to talk about another book. Now this isn't necessarily like a horror novel, but it did scare me like a lot. Like it really fucked me up. And that is The Devil of Non King by Mo Hader. Technically, The Devil of Non King is a thriller, I think, mystery novel. We're following this young English woman named Grey. Grey takes a trip. She goes to Tokyo. <laughs> so exciting. She's not there for vacation. No, Grey is there to find this one specific videotape. And that sounds weird. Like, why the fuck would she want a videotape? Just go to your fucking blockbuster, bitch. Go rent it, you know? No, you can't rent this kind of videotape. What Gray is searching for is this infamous, not really confirmed in existence, videotape from the 1937 massacre of Nanking. Gray is in Japan, in Tokyo, to find a man who is rumored to know what is on this tape, to have seen this tape. She finds this dude and she's like, hey. Actually, you no, know, she has an English accent, so she's like, Excuse me, um, could you, could you can't, could you tell me what's on this tape? And he's like, absolutely not. You think, you think I'm gonna tell you what's on that fucking tape? I don't know what you're talking about. No idea what you're talking about, never seen it. And she's like, um, it seems as though you have though. That's an oh, that's awful. <laughs> it seems like you have though, and I would just really appreciate if you could just be honest with me. And he's like, mm, no, don't want to. I'm not gonna tell you, so leave me alone. Gray has no choice but to stay in Tokyo to hopefully, eventually, convince this elderly man to tell her what's on the tape or even show her what's on the tape if he has it in her possession. Gray lives there in Tokyo. It's, it's wild, it's wild. Thinking about this book and thinking about where the places it goes let me see is actually insane like it, oh my god so when i read this book dude i'm literally so good at fucking holding my balance holy shit it could also be the wig though anyway when i first read this book i listened to the audiobook 10 out of 10 would recommend i thought it was kind of boring at first like the first i think i would say quarter and then the last quarter of the book i was hooked like literally hook line Sinker. Mo Hater does something in her prose to just snatch you. You know how they say that like pit bulls like their, their jaws lock when they when they bite and that's why everyone's like afraid of them? 
um, by the way, pit bulls are like the sweetest fucking dogs in the world. But anyway, it, the book is like that. You're, you're kind of like, oh my God, we're friends. Everything's great. And then <laughs> the book grabs onto you, locks its jaw and doesn't let go. Doesn't let go. I had this vivid, vivid memory of me lying in bed um, almost like a date I had once. Tiny, 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 tiny tangent. I was on a date once and we were in like my room and I was like, I was kind of like, oh my God. Uh, I was like on my bed, just relaxing, getting really, really comfortable. And I remember <laughs> the, the dude who was, um, the dude who was in my room, who was like also on my bed, uh, like laid down. <laughs> He laid down, he he turned on an HP Lovecraft audiobook. <laughs> and then and then and then he put his arms like <laughs> it, was, it was like one of the worst days I've ever been on. Anyway, that kind of reminded me of what I was about to say, but anyway, totally not at all relevant, just like a funny thing that that I just remembered. Anyway, okay. <laughs> I have a vivid memory of laying in bed, you know, just, just, <laughs> and listening to the audiobook of this book for like two or three hours, not doing anything, just laying in bed with the audiobook on and literally having heart palpitations for two fucking hours. Like, it scared the fuck out of me, especially just based on the synopsis. The synopsis doesn't seem that special. But then as soon as you read it, you're just like pushed into this world of mystery and crime. Literally, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you enough that you need to read this. Like, it's so good. It's so fucking spooky and suspenseful. And like I said, it scared the fuck out of me. There's something just so unsettling and off-putting about this book and so heart racing. I swear to God, if you don't like it, you can literally punch me in the face but like that's not gonna happen. The next horror book I wanna talk about is one that I read years and years and years and years ago. When I first heard of it, I was obsessed with it and I needed, needed a copy of it so I could read it immediately. Like it was one of those books, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you hear about a book and it sounds exactly like the kind of thing that you would like and I started reading it and I finished it within like 48 hours like it was nuts i'm talking about house of leaves by mark z danielewski so many people all the time um say like oh like i recommend you read house of leaves <laughs> and i'm like girl been there done that i know i know house of leaves is a is a fucking book People are like, oh my God, like, what's the epitome of a book? This, this is the epitome of a fucking book. Like, this is insane. First of all, we have to talk about the mental way that it's formatted, which is just chaotic. There are so many aspects of the book that are just almost, that are almost frightening in terms of its formatting, just alone. Not even the plot, not even the characters, but the formatting is scary. <laughs> I, didn't, I never noticed this, but the end papers on my copy are just full of nonsensical text. There are layers to House of Leaves. The first layer we have is Johnny Truant, who is a young tattoo parlor employee slash, I think like drug addict. He one day goes into his neighbor's apartment because his neighbor has died. His neighbor's name was uh, Zampano and he's died. And so Johnny and his friend go there and they're like looking around his apartment, you know, basically kind of being scumbags, trying to see what, if they can find something to fucking steal from this dead guy. Really great guys. And Johnny finds this, um, this manuscript called the Navidson Record. Having found almost nothing else, they take this manuscript and Johnny starts to read it. Second layer is this manuscript, the Navidson Record, which is a full-blown analysis of this documentary called The Navidson Record, which is about a dude named Navidson who is this blacklisted photographer, right? He got into some kind of scandal years before and he, nobody wants to fucking touch him. Nobody wants to even fucking look at him. Like he had like one thing where he was like, this is my claim to fame. And then after that, like nothing. He can't find his spark anymore. Davidson moves with his family to this new house in this new city. And he decides to document it for a documentary. When they move into this new house, 
Navidson and his wife discover that their house is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside, meaning that there are corridors or doorways in their home that don't belong there, that can't possibly be there based on how big their house is from the outside. So you have Johnny Truant leaving his footnotes and then you also have Zampano's footnotes and then you also have the actual Navidson record and then you also have the editors. Like it's a whole thing and I understand why it's called House of Leaves. It's just so much text, so much to go through, so many things to, to think about. Not to mention as well that it's actually terrifying actually fucking scary. Like I mentioned before, the first time and only time that I've read this book, I read it in a very quick amount of time. I literally like just spent hours and hours and hours in my room alone, just my face just in this book. It's been many, many years since I read this book and I for sure would want to one day read it again to see if I still have the same feelings about it. But the first time I read it, I was blown away. I loved it so fucking much. Actually, you know what? You know, it's actually kind of funny. So the same dude, remember the dude I was talking about before who like came over for like a date or whatever? We were on my bed and then he put on HP Lovecraft and you know, laid down like he was in a fucking coffin. That guy, that guy, he was like looking at my books. I remember this. And I was like, aren't they gorgeous? They're beautiful, these books. And he was like, yeah, they're okay. And he, he picked up House of Leaves and he was like, oh, have you, have you read this? And I was like, yeah, I have, it's like pretty good. I like really liked it. And he's like, yeah, I haven't read it. And he was like looking through it. He was like leafing through it. And he was like, you didn't like write in the book or like, you know, take notes or anything like that. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't write in my books. That's like not a thing that I'm into. And he was like, oh, well that's like the way you're supposed to read it. <laughs> this motherfucker. This motherfucker literally came in my house, fucking laid on my bed, put on a shitty HP Lovecraft audiobook, and then told me how to read a book that he hadn't read. If that's not the epitome of fucking straight white dudes, I don't know what is. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> anyway, so many tangents. But anyway, I can see how this book could be perceived as pretentious to so many people. Like even thinking about it now, I'm like, really, Danielewski, did you have to go to all that trouble to write this book? You could have literally just made like a normal book. But then again, if I think if it wasn't formatted the way it is, if it wasn't as complicated and detailed, I don't think as I don't think it would be as popular. The concept is interesting, but it's not necessarily like original. I think what makes this book special is how the formatting lends itself to the story because as I was reading it I would find that the formatting corresponded with what was happening in the plot. Take for instance one scene where a character is going through a very very small tunnel and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. As you turned the pages the text was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and things like that. Things like that I think are really really special and really really smart in terms of Danielewski uh, and how he crafted the book. Do I think that everyone should read this? No. I don't think some people would like this and I can understand why they wouldn't like it. For me, it's kind of like It by Stephen King, which is another favorite, which we'll talk about in, an, in like another video, where you feel as though like there's so much detail that really doesn't need to be there and it can kind of bog down the reader. But for me, what I really, really love about this book specifically is the Navidson record and how that story itself unfolds. Just so much to talk about. But I will say, it's scary. I think it's worth it. Um, and it's really, really interesting. And it's an experience. But yeah, we love this book. It's like a classic. The last book that I wanna talk to you about today, one of my favorite fucking books of all time, just period. I will always, always, always recommend this book to you, 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 definitely you, and you. It's one of those books that has lived with me and that has constantly just been an anchor point of horror majesty. What I'm talking about is The Ruins by Scott 
fucking Smith. I love this book so much. Like literally so fucking much. I know that there are people out there who don't fuck with this book and I genuinely don't understand. Like where are you coming from? Who are you? Who do you think you are? The Ruins by Scott Smith, which is classic, is about this group of American tourists. They go out to Mexico and they're like on vacation. <laughs> It's so fun, so freeing, so nice. It's two couples, um, so two dudes and two girls. And then there's one other dude who's from Germany who's like kind of been tagging along with them. And then there's also this other dude who's also tagging along who's like Greek. They're all having the time of their lives. They're like all like getting drunk. They're all kind of being hoes, but they're all like friends, they're all fun, everything's perfect. Until one day they're walking, you know, along and they're on this hilltop and they can't go down the hill. They can't get off the hill because a bunch of the natives are at the bottom of the hill waiting for them with like bow and arrows, with fucking hatchets and stuff. And so they're stuck on this hilltop and they're confused as to why they're being held hostage on this hilltop by these people because the people won't go up the hill to kill them. They're just waiting for them at the bottom. Our group of Americans are stuck on this hilltop with limited food, limited water, no real weapons to protect themselves. I'm not gonna say too much, but I will say that maybe, maybe there is something on that hilltop that wants to get them. You're just like, well, nom nom. <laughs> you know, just like, nom nom nom. <laughs> just a little, little chomp, a little, little bite, a little nibble. If I'm being honest with you, and I wanna be honest with you, this book, might be like top five favorite books of all time like it's so good i've read it twice this is one of the only horror books i've actually reread and it's just as good if not better the second fucking time i love it so much there's so much detail in these characters so much love put into the development of these people and their situation. The way that Scott Smith builds on chaos and builds on making these people not only like vulgar, disgusting, and horrible people, but also at the same time interesting. Hello? Oh my fucking God. I'm so glad I got you when I did. Okay, Mr. Smith. How did you do it? How did you do it? Just let me know. It's like, just whisper it to me. Whisper it to me. Just, just whisper it. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. That's fair. Um, if I could though, you don't want to tell me. I get it. I get it. Um, what I will say though is that your book is one of the most like compulsive, gorgeously written pieces of fiction I've ever read and you you master you master perfectly the line between having complete hatred for a character but also making them extremely fascinating and it as a reader I couldn't look away like I couldn't like I don't want to I don't want to sit here and suck your dick Mr. Smith you know what I mean but I fucking I loved it I loved it so much and I, I wish, I wish that you would write a third book. I don't care what it is. It could literally be anything. It could be like Peppa the fucking pig. I don't care. But I need a third book. I need something else from you. So if you could do that, like right away, I would love it. We would love that. It'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I try, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I can't wait to reread it again for the third time because I know I'm gonna love it even more a third time. It's one of those books that is just so compulsively readable and so good. And not only that, but like actually horrifying, like actually. Okay, okay, I know, I have to go too. I'm like, I'm like kind of busy, I guess. Yeah, I'm kind of busy, okay. Bye, kisses. I love this book, I love it so much. I'm serious, if you haven't read this, if you haven't even tried reading it or thought about it, rectify that. Rectify it. Do better.
I'm not even kidding. Not not just for me, but for Mr. Smith, okay? He, he, he is he is literally like my king. My friends, my family, my acquaintances. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know down below which horror books are your fucking favorite. I would love to know. Plus, I think it's fun. I always, always, always need more recommendations. So please go in the comments and just let me know. <laughs> Don't forget also, by the way, to hit subscribe because we talk about spooky shit. We talk about creepy shit. We talk about the ruins and shit. Read it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you in my next one. Bye!